Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of the Bigfoot Notes from the Field. Uh, News-wise, I'm trying to think, we haven't got a whole lot of news. We have a new member joined in Connecticut uh, today. So Don Gummo, who's our um, assistant regional director for the Northeast, I, I sent him his contact information. So Stephen, if you're listening, welcome. Uh, and for you guys who don't know, you know, we got some people uh, trouble getting on Blab and listening or participating. So uh, one of the questions was people were asking me if we could put the, the shows on YouTube. So that's what I've been doing. I've been uploading the, the recorded ones already onto YouTube, and then I'll be putting them on every week. You know, after, we, after we're done, I'll uh, put those on YouTube. So, you know, if you can't listen to them here, you know, tell, tell people you might know who can't uh, to go to my YouTube channel and they're loaded up there. So uh, I've only got about, I think 11 or 12 of them up there so far, but, uh, you is know, it it, it's, huh? Is it 11 or 12? And one of the two, I don't know. I, I load them up. I don't, I keep, 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 I've been writing them down to make sure I, I know which ones I put on there and they're not put up there twice. So, uh, so that's, what's going on. Uh, I'm not really doing any writing. I'm kind of suspended writing at the moment, uh, in favor of trying to get the, uh, the podcast, the premium co podcast up and going. Now, one of the problems I've had with it would be actually available by now, but I, I paid a guy, a professional, to make me a, uh, a professional introduction, you know, a lead in, you know, with the music and all that stuff. And uh, he had some personal problems. And then, you know, one thing led to another. And I, I paid the guy in March to make this thing like a three minute intro. And it still hasn't happened. So now I'm going to have to find, you know, somebody else that can do this for me. I'm still recording interviews. In fact, if anybody, uh, you know, listening, if you've had a Bigfoot encounter or two and, and you, you'd be interested in uh, doing an interview with me, uh, we can do it either with, uh, I've been recording with um, Skype, but I also have a, a way to record over the telephone also. And then uh, those are, I'm kind of stockpiling those so that when the podcast start you know i'll be posting those to itunes and my website williamjebning.com once a week so you'll be able to go up there and, and listen to those uh and just so everybody knows it is it is a paid show it's five dollars a month which is really low when it comes to things like this because everybody else is charging you know anywhere from seven to nine dollars to twelve dollars a month and uh you know i i think i think for what you're getting you're getting and it's primarily uh, eyewitness accounts. It's the witnesses telling their story. So it's it's a pretty good show. Uh, the show is going to be called Witness of the Unknown. And I'm hoping as soon as I get the intro done, uh, we're going to put that up and it'll be available. First, we're going to continue doing the blabs here every week. Uh, and that's, you know, the way it is. It's not going to cost anything. It's This is always free, what we do here. Nobody paid for this anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for that. So let me let me give a real quick plug here to our friends at the Sasquatch Coffee Company. Uh, Gunner though, and, and folks are all really good people. So, and then our own stuff. Now, I want to give a special mention to uh, Shane Church. He's the the artist that made this artwork, and Shane is working on a couple new pieces. Uh, I don't want to give away the one that's almost done. It's pretty good. It's actually kind of a reboot of a really old cartoon uh but it's really it's really great when it comes to this subject and he he listens every week i didn't know he was actually listening to the uh the blab but he sent me an email the other day and he says oh by the way when i'm done with this when i'll start working on the uh uh the happy meal cartoon <laughs> <laughs> so I, I told him, I said, well, be careful on the copyright part. And, and Shane, if you're listening, you know, we, we have to skirt around, you know, using McDonald's references. So, uh, and I guess the other news, of course, Brian, Brian here has been writing uh, a screenplay based on my book, In Search of the Unknown. And Shane, uh, or Brian, I read through it today. It looks really great. Of course, now that, now that you've got to the end, there's, you know, some definitely some suggestions I'll make. And, and I guess I'll just go through it section by section, and you and I will work on it. And I'm going to send it to Milo so he can look at it, too, since he was involved in it and oh uh, get his input. <laughs> yes, I was. So, uh, I don't know if uh, the topic of the show – oh, go ahead, Brian. Go ahead. 
Oh, oh well, I was just gonna say about your um about the show about the um the, the eyewitness. I, I I will say that having listening to you for you know you know tons of 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 these months, I can tell you that that when you um, identify a witness and you um, talk to them and you can get their story out, it's just the best thing that you could possibly get. Definitely, um, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you are a masterful interviewer. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I give you a little bit of a plug to, to that. I, I don't think I'm that good. I think I think I just kind of I just kind of bumble through them. But you know, uh, you know, the ones I have recorded so far, and I've, like I said, I've got about three months worth recorded. Uh, you know, and and in a list of people yet to record. Uh, there's some really good encounter stories that I've already got uh, ready to go. So. Uh, you know, people are going to enjoy the podcast. And like I said, for for five bucks a month, you know, you're getting you're getting four shows. It works out to a buck and a quarter a show. It's going to be available on iTunes and my website, WilliamJabney.com. So, uh, and, and what what and what's that? Go ahead, Brian. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just saying, um, one of the, one of the things that I th- that it, I think is awesome when you interview people is that you tell them to explain their story first. Like you don't ask questions. You tell yeah. them, Hey, tell me exactly what was happening at that day, at that time. And that kind of um, feeds into the genuine, like, you know, the, the genuine report. Yeah. You know, in, in my opinion, it doesn't do a whole lot of good to start asking them a whole bunch of pointed questions because you can misdirect them or maybe derail them from their train of thought. I want to hear, I want to hear what it was that they experienced. Kind of like a story. You know, you know, yeah, and then we can go back and ask questions, or you know, sometimes I'll, I'll maybe ask them to, to clarify something as we go along, you know, or if I if I think, especially somebody, you know, like there's a couple out there that I've actually interviewed previously, uh, you know, privately, and um, you know, sometimes they they tend to get ahead of themselves, and I'll have them back up a little bit so we we try to get a, a you know a, a chronological. Uh, order of events as they happen. So, did you record? Like, what's that? Oh, did you record uh, Brandy's on Skype? Yeah, actually, or? actually, our our friend Tom Carroll and I uh, recorded that because Tom had some questions he wanted to ask, and and hopefully Tom will will be able to get back involved with us at some point because Tom uh, is really great. He has a really great perspective and. And we'll sometimes dig a little bit deeper into some of the certain aspects, you know, of an encounter, you know, where I'm looking at more of the, the overview yeah. and, and we'll, we'll target real specific things that, that based on my experience, what, what I'm looking for informationally. And sometimes Tom will able to dig up some of those kind of grassroots portions and, and, and open up even more things. So, um, yeah, that interview actually was uh, was a really interesting one. So, uh, cool. and like I said, our, our friend Mister Black has has consented to do an interview. Of course, I have to disguise his voice and everything, but uh, uh, that's something that Tom was going to help me with also, and and also David. So uh, that'll be a really, you know, that'll be a one of a kind uh, situation. Here. Oops, looks like Scott's having Scott's having difficulty. And there's Joe. Hello, Joe. How you doing, buddy? Uh, so that's kind of that's kind of the the news scene, you know. There's just some different things going on. Uh, like I said, I've been posting everything these blabs, and I'm going to be doing it every week from now on. I'm going to post them on my YouTube channel. So if anybody's having trouble coming here looking at these, uh, you know, they can go there and just click on them and listen. And you will see this, and the video is there too, so you'll see us uh, clowning around and, and talking and stuff. So, <laughs> so I guess the only other thing I'd have news wise is, of course. We're always looking for new members for the Jevening Research Group. Uh, we have new members all across the country, all across Canada. Uh, hoping to get some people in Alaska interested, but uh, every we're looking for people everywhere. Uh, we have a team in Australia that's growing, one in England and one in Norway. So uh, we're not we're not just localized here to the U.S. You know, we want to expand the network, and and what we are is we're a we're a network of field researchers, uh, and we all work closely with each other, share information, you know, uh, moving towards the goal of uh, resolving the issue of, of the Sasquatch existence. Did you hear so, what's go- what happened in Alaska? 
where What's four, that? four campers or hunters got two got murdered and the other two are missing. When did this happen? Um, I just read about it. It probably about th th during the Fourth of July weekend. Any any idea? Did they say? I'm I'm looking it, into it. Really, I I got like uh, um, friends up there that uh, that are checking it out too. So there's so no really no idea what the cause no, was they, or anything. They talked about they said Bigfoot. So really. Yeah. That, that was that was the official saying that or no it's it's uh probably more hearsay than or second hand okay so it wasn't like the uh maybe the reporters or somebody hey there's scott how you doing this evening yeah right now i just it's kind of like yeah, it's different <laughs> oh, scott, scott's audio is there he is <laughs> <laughs> is 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 your audio working, buddy? I got the camera on backwards. You'll figure. Oh, there it is. Okay, I guess he's he's still trying to figure out the camera. So on the phone. So uh, Bruce Kelly, he's the one that suggested topics for discussion this evening. And oops, I, I can still hear him. <laughs> So the topic this evening, folks, is Sasquatch evidence and why it's changed over the past 50 years. Is that me echoing? I don't. I, no. Maybe, I think maybe, maybe that was Scott's phone. I hear you, but it sounds like it's coming over to somebody else's laptop. I, I hear you okay. Okay. Oh, maybe it's Scott. Okay, just saying, Scott, turn your volume off or get earbuds. <laughs> that might be what it is. Maybe it's coming through his phone and, and coming back through. So anyway, uh, Bruce had a great idea. And one of the things that really drives me crazy about this subject is having known this topic for a long time, you know, 43 years of involvement now. Uh, when you go back and look at the first two or three decades and the reports, and a lot of those in John Green's books and a few other people's books from those times, one of the things you notice is a lot of uh, common commonalities between the witness accounts. There's a lot of similar particulars from one story to the next. In other words, there wasn't all this tree structure stuff. There wasn't, you know, ob the obvious stuff like, you know, the interdimensional garbage and Mind speaking Sasquatch and that kind of baloney. Uh, that's that's sort of the above and beyond stuff, if you ask me. But just the basic stuff. There wasn't a lot of stuff back then. Okay, I heard a little bit of echo there. I'm not sure where that came from. Uh, there was a lot of stuff back then that you didn't hear that you hear now. And and I'll give you for instance on that. Uh, I would almost bet you. See, now I am hearing an echo. I don't know what's wrong with that. Yeah, I think that's coming from Scott or somebody. You think so? Because it happened just as he got on. Okay. Um, if you were to go back and look at reports, especially with these tree structures and things like that, I would bet that you would not see any of that stuff prior to 2010. And there's a reason I say that. Uh when I first found snap trees back in 1991, uh, that really that kind of stuff wasn't talked about anymore, and it was really very little known. In fact, when I went to Bob Titmus's house one time back in '88, uh, and he showed me, you know, the little twisted tree limbs that he found, and he had found lots of them, and he said that he always found them, with, uh, you know, in conjunction with Sasquatch footprints. So he was pretty sure that's what was doing it. So he didn't know what to think of it. I personally didn't know what to think of it because I hadn't really seen anything like that. And to me, what he had was too easy, would have been too easily, uh, could have been made by weather conditions, you know, with, with small, and they weren't, they weren't very big. They were, they were relatively small. So uh, I didn't think much about it. I kept it in the back of my mind until 1991. 
and I told this before when when my friend Jack and I were hiking up in the Washougal River watershed, and we were way back in there. I mean, <laughs> really deep into that country, long way from any accessibility. Uh, we were 2,200 feet up in elevation on this slope, and I found the first tree. And when I know, I found 13 of them in a line. And the only reason I stopped following that line is because we were running out of daylight. So, uh, and I found another one a few years later in Northern California. And then I started seeing them here and there, but not, you didn't find them often. I mean, it was, it was not something that was common. But once you'd see something like that, you'd see it really fast. And I always theorized that if these creatures, you know, had been around here for hundreds, even thousands of years, and if they did things that other primates do, which is comparative anthropology, and it's very something very reasonable to expect, you know, we look at what other primates do. Maybe not out of the question if they do something maybe to mark territory in one fashion or another. Uh, I thought to myself, well, okay, this is reasonable. So I thought if they do something, it had to already existed. In other words, people would see this when they first came to the Pacific Northwest, we'll say, and it was just part of the background. It wasn't anything special. So when you looked at the snap trees, you wouldn't realize what it was unless you knew what it was. And then it would just stand out instantly. You know what I'm saying? Right. So after I published Notes from the Field in 2010, and I, I really had to think hard about putting those pictures in that book and I did it just because well partly I knew I knew all this stuff was going to come out everybody was going to start seeing this stuff everywhere whether it was weather breaks or, or what have you it was going to be out there every place so um, I put it out because I was the first one that really discovered it and, and I wanted my name attached to it so and as soon as I put that out in the book it went people went crazy with every every everything that looked you know, trees that fall together look like something that could be Sasquatch. People were jumping on it, making that claim. You know, so that's an example of, of uh, because prior to that, I mean, the, the stories were fairly consistent in details. You know, you never really got any of this extra stuff. It was always the person had a sighting. They talk about what the creature did, if it made sounds. Um, and that was pretty much it. Sometimes they saw him eating, sometimes, you know, doing whatever kind of behavior then the creature would take off. That was kind of in a nutshell what a lot of the stories were. And, and, and Will, um, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. It, no, no, go right ahead. Right ahead. But, but uh, didn't you even say the two that, like, um, like when you and Renee were, were um, kind of discussing this, you actually intentionally withhold or withheld information from the witnesses? to gauge their authenticity of their accounts. Yeah, they they used to tell me uh, that that's one of the things they did. That was standard procedure was to, you know, to not really give away a lot of information. And and, and I still interview people that way. Uh, you know, I go, and like you were saying, you know, it, it's a style of interviewing. You let people tell their story and then you listen to what they're saying and listen for the particulars. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, you can kind of tell, especially because there's some, today there's so much information out there. Before, we would hold things back. And if they would say something that was a piece of information that was held back, something that wasn't exposed publicly, right? right then right. then it was then it was a pretty sure guess that what they were saying was accurate. There, there was there was a, a, a credibility right. dimension added to their story. So, but today, you know, everybody just blasts everything out in public because... Uh, you know, they want attention. So they put everything out there. You know, they scrape the bottom of the barrel for little tidbits and they blast it out there because they want to be experts in, in a little Bigfoot. <laughs> Sorry, I had to laugh about that one. <laughs> There's no such thing as experts. It's true. it's true. It's true. It is. So today you have to listen to people's stories more carefully because uh because people inadvertently hear things or see things, whether it's on television or YouTube or wherever, radio shows, podcasts, and those artifacts can get stuck in their head, whether they want them to or not. Uh, and when if they see something, you know, in, in their way of explaining it, 
they might inadvertently use some of those artifacts that they picked up along the way. It's part of their frame of reference. Right, right. So you have to listen for that, and then you have to ask, well, is is that real, or is that something that they injected into the story as a way of explaining something that they wouldn't know how to explain otherwise? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, aside from the people who just make things up out there, and there, there's a few of those, but... Uh, <laughs> We, but we won't go down that road today. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. What are you guys? What are you guys' thoughts on that? I mean, there's, there's, uh, man. I mean, you know, like I said, the, the, it, and it's not that they. I, I can't say that they won't utilize, you know, making some kind of a structure with trees. But some of these really ornate things. Uh, and I looked at some of these, and, and I'll tell you, here's here's a good example. One of my, one of our people who's a. Um, uh, Native American on the Flathead Reservation, uh, Win. Uh, he he sent me some. He sent me a message once, and he says, "You know, I had a thought about some of these structures." He says, "You know, a lot of hunters will go, serious hunters go off the grid. You know, and they'll they'll take their backpacks and they'll go hunting a long ways, and it's a lot easier to say take just the cover of a structure than it is to take the structure itself. In other words." They'll take tree limbs and they'll set them up in such a way where all they got to do is they go to their their camp and they use it every year, and and they drape the the covering over it and they've got their shelter, right? So he said a lot of these things that people are claiming are Bigfoot structures may be nothing more than something a, a serious hunter has set up, or you know, a serious outdoors person. You know what I mean? Yeah, and and, and will um, I, you, you tell the story in the in, in the in the book? Um, I, I I'm sorry, I forget the name uh, of the guy, but didn't like um, he see like a like a puddle of water and thought that it was like a big foot? <laughs> yeah, yeah the, uh, th there's there's some people, and again, like I said, there are people who would jump on any little aspect of this subject and and utilize it to to make themselves look like there's somebody. So one of the people that I, I came into contact with, and this was back in the late eighties, I uh, was a gentleman by the name of Datus Perry. Oh yeah. Datus. And I, I won't go into, we can talk about Datus at length at another time, but, and then of course in, in the updated version of uh, in search of the unknown Datus Perry occupies about 14 pages in there. So, which actually will translate into more in the actual uh, volume. But, uh, you know, I, I was associated with Datus for a number of years, and and he was basically worthless when it comes to information. But because he lived on the other side of Skamania County, I couldn't be running. You know, I mean, I, I had so much area to cover, so I, I needed people in outlying areas as context. If they heard something, then they'd call me, and I could go out and and you know make a special trip. But uh, I was working you know, Clark and Skamania counties systematically. So I, I really needed those contacts out there. So Datus was one of those contacts. And every time, you know, we get a call, we race out there and, and nothing ever panned out. So in one of these times, and this was funny, this is one of the last times I went anywhere with Datus Perry was that uh, my good friend Carlos Bazito and I, uh, Carlo got a call from Datus and uh, Datus as well. You know, there was a witness that saw a Sasquatch, and it was near where I had my second sighting on the Washoe River. But Datus insisted that we go all the way to Carson to his house. Now, that was more than twice the distance away. And then he insisted on driving his old Rambler station wagon with us in it back to the location. And he didn't drive the highway. Oh, no, we had to go the long way around through Skamania County. And, of course, it was raining it was ter hor horrible weather that day. So I was wet and I don't particularly enjoy being wet. <laughs> and uh, I, I was not a happy camper by the time we arrived back at, at the place where we could have been there in 15 or 20 minutes had we known where the spot was from my house. Um, so we, we, um, we arrived at the spot and, and the ground there is, is a lot of gravel. It's, it's very hard packed. And Datus and Carlo were arguing over a mud puddle. You know, Datus was saying, well, it's a Bigfoot track. Carlo said it's a mud puddle. I looked at them both like they were both insane. And I walked off. I was fed up with both of them. So 
I uh, I happened to there was an old old log, a really old overgrown one, barely a trail left there. So I was walking down. And I thought I just wanted to get away from those two and their and their bickering. So and to calm down a little bit. So I walked down this road. And there was a big pile of gravel there. It was probably four or five feet high. It was it was a really large one, and um, uh, there were two huge footprints in this gravel. Now I, I weigh I weighed a ton of about two hundred pounds. I didn't make even a scratch on this gravel, but these tracks were 18 inches long and they were more than six inches deep in this gravel. Beautiful outlines, you know, not great detail, but because of the gravel, it was, you know, fairly, uh, uh, I don't know, probably inch diameter gravel angular. <laughs> so we, we, um, we got up there and I told the guys, I said, Hey, I, I think I found the tracks, you know, they both ignored me, so and they were still arguing over a damn mud puddle. So I said, "The hell with both of them," and I, I quit going out <laughs> with with Datus. I said, "That I, you know, enough of Datus." But um, you know, the Sasquatch had been there. The witnesses, we never did find the witness, of course, because Datus had the contact information, and I think it was all in his head. I don't think he ever wrote anything down. So, <laughs> you know. Anyway, that was that was that story. But actually, Will, I was thinking about um, another, like an older guy. Like he was like almost in his eighties, I think. That was that, Datus. that was Datus. Oh, 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 okay, okay, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Datus. no, yeah, no, Datus. I, and I don't know if you guys, this is a little off topic, I guess, but you know it's how these blabs go. You know, we sort of start one place and we go all kinds of directions. Yeah. But um, <laughs> Datus, when I met Datus, he was in his eighties. I mean, the guy looked about a hundred and eighty. But uh, and he always insisted insisted on driving, and and the mountains north of of uh, Carson, Washington, are, are pretty steep. They're pretty big mountains, and he would always drive. He had one speed. It was as fast as his old van could go, and uh, you know, which was usually about you know fast enough to kill us all. <laughs> and there was only two seats. The front two seats. He usually took his uh, his uh, his wife with us, and so the two of them were in the front. And Davis is driving like this, muttering under his breath the whole time. And the van is full of old car parts and just junk, garbage, crap. And poor Carlo and I, man, we're, we're sitting on this junk, being thrown back and forth. And, and I just knew we were going to go careening over a cliff, you know, into a thousand foot you know, gorge yeah. and die in a ball of flame at any time. <laughs> yeah. I mean... I, not, okay, I was scared. I was scared to death every time he went with Datus. And it got to the point where I said, no, I think either Car to Carlo, I said, either you or I are going to drive. We're not letting Datus drive anymore. <laughs> or before we go up these places, you know, we're going to have him stop. I'm going to walk up the hill. We'll let him drive and kill himself. I'm going to walk. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. So when you, when you find all this, you know, you know, when you're looking and you see these snap trees and stuff, yeah. the diameter or even the structures, I mean, some of them look like they're, I can carry them. You yeah, know? absolutely. I, I always look, I mean, my criteria is usually something that's, that's so far uh, out of the ordinary. In other words, right. I, I, I'll see weathered ones, especially old ones that are a year or two old. And I'll think, yeah, that's probably what that is. But I usually don't pay a lot of attention to that stuff. I, I look for the fresh stuff. In fact, when I put notes from the field, both those, uh, the first one was in 1991. The second one I found in 2003. Right. And and they were both, both of them I found in the month of July. Uh, there was no bad weather. They were freshly done, uh, you know, very similar to one another. And they were so, the second one was and it's because of the type of tree it was it was a it was a ponderosa pine and those don't snap quite as easily they're a little bit more i i, I hate to say rubbery, but kind of kind of like that they don't snap that easy so it was twisted like this like you would like you'd wring water out of a cloth okay, well that that's yeah I like that, that was that was crazy now i'm telling you it was in the middle of a stand of trees there were probably 20 or 30 of them the same age same height and everything and um, it was right in the middle. 
So if it was weather or anything else, the tree standing right next to it would have been done. So this one was picked out right in the center and like done this. And there were no bear claw marks or anything like that on it. Uh, I always look for all these things to try to weed out any possibility. You know, Bigfoot's the very last thing that I'll think about. And only if if I can't think of another reason why, uh, you know, it could be something else. <clears throat> so, I mean, anyway. And, and, and we'll, um, I guess, to change the, the, the subject a little bit, um, again, um, <laughs> Um, about the, the topic, um, why hasn't it changed in the past 50 years? Like, like, what is your take on that? I mean, like, because I know that, like, you know, obviously when, when Teddy Roosevelt was, was writing about the Bowman story, you know, that, that was yeah. like decades ago. But how has it changed in recent years? Well, that's a good point. Um, you know, I, of course, now, you know, we, we get all these uh, and, and one of the big things is uh what do you call it the um uh, uh hi there okay we got somebody calling it uh what do you call them uh people call them blob squatch which i think are totally useless uh you know you get a ton of people putting this junk out there and it's just that it's junk i think you know there's nothing useful in any of that it's it's all guesswork it's um Uh, uh, Brian, it's, it's speculation. It's spec. It's all speculation. Yeah, exactly. In and see, there's there's two there's two big problems, or not problems. There's two main, uh, there's two main directions. Uh, Brian, that this topic, Brian. and one of them is the predominant one that's been going all this time, and it's all these people Hello. either doing doing guesswork Hello. and nonsense. Hello. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hi. So, so I just wanted to know, uh, Brian, how do you get that uh, skin color, uh, the red shade that you have there? The what? The what red shade, the, the red skin color that he has. I, I have a tan, but I haven't been able to get the redness that he has that I'm trying to achieve. <laughs> well, I guess it's, it's just uh, living in Florida. Oh, okay. So you have sunburn. I see. Yeah, yeah, I guess sunbird can whatever you want to call okay, it. Okay, we're not we're not. You can keep calling in, but we're not gonna we're not gonna do nonsense here tonight. Uh, oh, let's bring let's bring Joe on. Joe wants to come on, so we'll bring Joe on. You know that's. Hey Joe, how are you doing, guys? Good. How are the you? One nice doing? thing about what we do with a you know sensible discussion, we'll talk. Hi. Tell us what he likes. I don't care. It doesn't matter. This is this is our chat. So, you know, bugger off. <laughs> That's, hey, Joe, how you doing, buddy? I, uh, I really don't good, care. Man. You know, you know what I'm saying. It's it's we're here to do this, and and it's this is for us and for our people. If you don't want to be part of it, if you're going to be a knucklehead. Take a hike. You know. Yeah, there's a couple of I trolls was, in here. <laughs> I I was a drill sergeant in the army, so I'm being very nice in this part of my life, but I can revert back to that really quickly. So, Oh, yeah, man, uh, me too. I'll tell you what. I used to be that, really, really a, a thuggish kind of a guy, and these people just don't know, man. <laughs> so anyway, um, I don't know where we were at with this. Um, Joe, we're talking about uh, some of the stuff, and I know we were talking about was this uh, stuff like these blob squatch pictures. You know, these people put stuff on uh, – you know, Facebook and all over the place. And, and they, it's all, it's all geared to get a lot of attention. And I, I've had people look at my own pictures. I had a couple pictures that uh, one picture had something kind of interesting in it. I didn't know what it was, but what I, what I wanted somebody to do was to try to enhance it, to see what was in the picture. So I had somebody, a couple people did it. And what they did was there was an object at the top of the picture and they would go down to this part of the picture and come up with all kinds of these different, uh, you know, images that were supposed to be Bigfoot, and there was nothing there. I, mean, I was standing 50 feet from the tree line when I took the picture, so I know what was there and what wasn't there. But when I took this other picture, there was something up in the upper part of the tree. So, um, brother, uh, 
anyway, that's that's where you know a lot of these come from. And if you notice when you look at some of those blob squatch pictures, one of the things that's interesting is uh, they're the same color. The image, whatever it is, is supposed to be the object in the picture is the same color as the background. You know, so you know, these guys, I don't know about some of these people. Yeah, I can even kick them out. That's what, that's what you need a feature. To so anyway, them. you know, that's one of the things that we see today, and along with the uh, the tree structures and stuff like that. So, how about the rocks that were stacked way out there? I mean, didn't I mean weren't those those were unusually see? That's the kind of stuff. If I can do it, yeah. It, it's not Sasquatch. It's kind of like art. If if I can do art, then I wouldn't be here. You know what I mean? Well, the rock stack thing is is something that you don't find very often, and those are only in right. certain places. So, uh, uh, I don't know about these people. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, they're like insects. You just pull their wings off, and then they... <laughs> They, you watch them screw around. You yeah, know? exactly. I, I can't wait to find these kind of people. Hey, hey, hey Will, um, this is kind of curious like, that you brought up this, it up about the rock formations. Yeah. yeah. Um, wh what do you think about those things? I mean, are they like kind of territorial things? Or um, like, like what's your take on that? Well, you know, from the inside sources I have, they talked about – two kinds of markings these things do one of them was the, the snap trees and yet and the other right. one they didn't yeah. mention but yeah. they both had to do with navigational purposes so uh that's kind of i mean whether it's the rock stacking we don't know because and i and i do have a picture from a, a native guy up in canada and it's a very rudimentary it's not one of these fancy structures these are actually pretty good sized trees and there's only four or five of them put together so uh you know that's something that i would say could definitely be done by these things and it could be like a navigational marking because of where it's located but uh you know as far as the rock stacking goes that was something that that really nobody knows about except us and i've kept all the the locations secret and we've actually had witnesses recently discover uh more of those so you know it, we don't really have the full story in those yet it's still kind of a big unknown yeah and it could be um very specific to one particular group i mean it's not necessarily a, a thing that's like you know widespread through all sasquatches it, it may have been only that particular group i think well it could be except um yeah. we have sites in oregon we have sites in washington and british columbia Mm -hmm. So it's it's definitely more it's something more than uh, you know than what one group would do. It's it's, it's a larger behavioral uh, thing that's going on. But again, we don't know what uh, yeah you know what the purpose of that is. So yeah yeah. So I'm not sure. I mean, there's other stuff that's and everybody's getting distracted with this stupid stuff, but. Uh, there's some other there's some other stuff you see out there. Uh, more than stupid. <laughs> you know there is Just other stuff. I was, I was hoping Bruce would come on because Bruce had. Uh, uh, oh, Bobby, you found the rock stacks up there too. Hey, hey Will, I was going to ask you. Um, aside from this nonsense that's going on on the, on the yeah. chat board. But you heard from Jeremiah. Um, anything going on in in New York? Or? Well, Don told me today he's been in the field a whole a lot lately. So he just came back. Uh, it was actually pretty good timing because of the new member in Connecticut. Uh, so, you know, Don Don didn't say anything about him because those two uh, are in touch. I know Jeremiah's supposed to be back in a, in a couple of weeks from his business. So, uh, I don't know really any updates in the field there. Don said. Just been uh, recently, so, you know, we'll see what's going on with him. Yeah. And Don was on here earlier. Oh, he he still is. I don't know, Don, if you had any uh, uh, updates from your field expeditions, but 
Oh, oh, and uh, hey, well, while, while we're waiting, um, have you heard anything about the the, the Whitehall movie? Um, it supposedly came out like you know last month or whatever, but uh, there was talk about it uh, in previous months about. I guess it was in Whitehall, New York. I'm not familiar. Yeah, with that area. I can't remember what it. Somebody um, somebody told me something about it or asked me. No. Yeah. Somebody actually interviewing last week who was talking about um, that they know the police detective that was involved in that and they spoke spoke to him directly about that so I was actually waiting to get some more information on that but uh, they said you know from getting direct information apparently there was a lot of stuff that went on you know about that whole situation afterwards uh, so there was more stuff that um, right, the right. person involved had a lot more information than yeah. what was put out in the movie or, or any of the news stories. Yeah, yeah. So are they, I don't know, are I mean, they following up on everything that happened in, in New Mexico? Nothing new, actually. The, a real tight lid's been put on that. Uh, That's crazy. And I was talking to the the cop or cop buddy down there and he can't get any information. Uh, you know, Mr. Black was going to do some searching and, and we haven't heard anything from him yet. So, uh, apparently they knew there, I knew there were two other incidents. There was something involving a, uh, a vehicle that was destroyed and a bunch of, uh, dairy cattle that were killed. And that was the only other information we got besides the guy that was beat up and put in the hospital. So, Wow, all that, but that wasn't put out before either. No, I mean that was that was just from, you know, my conversation with him. He was trying to do some, uh, do some checking, and uh, that's that's all the information he could get. I mean, everybody's been cut off, so no no information. Wow, because that that's just bizarre how how the feds just can go in there and do that. Well, see, we know about these things, um, you know, from the inside inside sources that, uh, you know, they're already on top of a lot of this stuff. And, uh, yeah. you know, there's just once they get involved, and it really depends on uh, uh, what's going on, you know, with uh, other people in the area. Now, there must have been other reports going on that alerted them, and we don't know what the number is. There apparently is a certain number of, uh, you know, whether people, people report to police, you know, forest service or whoever, uh, when a, cer a certain number triggers their involvement, plus they were already involved in that area pretty heavily. So, uh, you know, well, for them to be there that quickly and, and they were there, you know, respond like that. Yeah. They, they must've been there from the get go. Kind of like been. they, you know, watched it. Right, uh, and see when that stuff happened last year, they were there monitoring that group. So they they were already there when the cops went there and knew what was going on. So, and that's how um, you know T.W. And, and the other deputy got themselves in trouble because these guys had already filmed them, they'd recorded the audio, and these guys had gone home. So when uh, you know the, the next day when they were off shift, they called. Um, or TW's, uh, what do you call it, uh, chief of police called him three hours into his sleep time and said, you need to get in here right away. So he went in there, and here were these two guys, and TW actually photographed their cruiser with the license plate. He ran the plates, and it came back uh, Homeland Security. So, uh, you know, that's the one thing about having having police officers as members of our, our organization, you know, we can, we can find some information out when we need to. So, but, uh, some of this stuff now, like, like this particular situation that just happened, uh, it's been, they put a really tight lid on it. So there must be really serious what's going on there. And that's the only thing we can figure out is, uh, whatever the situation was, it's bad. And, uh, oh, looks like he, he had tried to come in. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I mean, uh, you know, that's that's what's happening there. 
Do you guys, what do you guys see in, on Facebook and places like that as far as stuff that's out there that wasn't? Well, I just, I just saw that on Facebook about what's going on in Alaska with the, you know, with the four, the two dead hunters and the two missing ones of a camping party or whatever, a hunting party. Yeah, you know, now that's some stuff that I don't think was really ever talked about before a whole lot. That might, it is. Yeah, but it, it's just, it. but it's little snippets like that, that, you know, it catches your eye and then there's right. nothing, there's nothing else. There's like, okay, now what? Okay. Yeah. I mean, where is it? Uh, how long ago? You know, but it's just little little things that tease your head you know so it's yeah drives me nuts oh yeah but what i'm looking for though is all that kind of stuff up here where you know like the missing hikers and and stuff yeah. like that like that guy in the olympics where he i mean that just that whole story just drives me to go look harder at that yeah i think it's something that people ignored or really didn't pay attention to some aspects to this subject where, you know, like I said, now John Green had about 4,000 reports in his files. And a lot of those, you know, were published in his books and some other people's books. And there was kind of a consistency between all those reports. You know, if you look at them, I mean, with different different people, details, and things like that. But there's kind of a general sense of consistency with what was seen and, and behaviors and things like that. But a lot of things weren't ever considered because... You know, back in those days, they were thought to be solitary. They were thought to be basically, you know, shy or elusive. Uh, it was very simplistic the way it was approached. They didn't do any comparative anthropology in those days. You know, where today yeah. our approach is we're looking at what, what do other primate species do? And then we can compare that with these things. There, there are certain expectations, and Mark Dobbs even brought it up, who's our forensic anthropologist. He said... <laughs> There are certain things that, you know, for these things to be a living, breeding species of primate should do and we could expect them to do. So there are things that we could look for in the reports, certain behaviors, things like that. And, there's, and he even suggested um, there could even be uh, rudimentary tool use. I haven't seen anything like that myself, but, yeah, you know, tool use is a pretty broad topic, so we well, don't really know what to look for in that. I mean, it, to to the point where the, the snapping of the trees, I mean, before I never paid any attention to any of that. Nobody did. Until recently. But even if when we went to Ape Canyon, when we went as kids, you know, right. I, I look at that and say, you know, I never even looked at anything like that. None of us you know I wasn't that looking for anything out of place where it was like, hey, all I'm supposed to do out here is look for something big and hairy walking across the pasture. You know, right. that's... Yeah, remember we found, so, that line of, we found that line of tracks, but it, it, there could have been all kinds of sign in front of us, and we would have never thought anything about it because it would have come off as looking like, you know, the wind was blowing hard while it broke the tree over or did all these things. So, yeah, I mean, you know, who knows what we would have notice had we known what to look for right now it's like that's what all you do look for now is unusual something that i know i can't do and there's you know? other things so, there's people people that talk about glyphs i mean come on now that that's just ridiculous or this <laughs> you know um what do you call it when they they're, they're nodding hair and stuff like that? I mean, or, hair. or the or the big one. I I read something, and this was hilarious. I mean, there there's there's like I, I was starting to say earlier. There's kind of two two ways you can approach this subject. One has been the way that everybody's done it this whole time. It's all guesswork. It's junk. It's opinions. Uh, and some of those people want to just include everything they want to take every story out there and just put it into the database you know without um uh you know vet it anyway you know you have to vet a story because we know i mean i i've had a couple there was a couple i can think of off the top of my head where you know i sort of went along with them and then found out later that they were they were lies or hoaxes so uh this guy's a retard. 
<laughs> anyway, uh, then the other approach is like what we're trying to do. You know, we gather evidence, run it through a system. You know, we do it uh, collecting information like the police do. Uh, kind of like we said, a combination of archaeology and, and police work. And then run that. And once we've collected it properly and then run it through our experts you know, or anthropologists and people like that, you know, and then we go from there. It's not not guesswork, not opinions. This guy must not have anything better to do, does he? Hey, hey, in a basement. Hey, well, yeah, go ahead. Here's kind of a, a weird question. Um, what would you say is the difference between Rene and his research versus uh, John Green's research? Oh, it was a big That's difference. A um, I like well, that. Green, Green was a uh, he was a newspaper editor, a, journal, a journalist. That's what his profession was. So. Green would collect the information. He would interview people, things like that. De Hinden was more hands-on. He was the field guy. He was out looking. He was talking to people. He was looking for evidence. Yeah, they were. Yeah, they were very, very night and day difference between the two of them. Yeah, yeah. Because I know that in 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 your book, you kind of like hint at there's some kind of disappointment with with John Green. But yeah, uh, yeah. Well, because I used to send stuff to him when I when I first got involved and, and started going out and finding stuff. You know, I'd take pictures and, and I'd send them to Green, and uh, you know, he would send stuff. He'd send letters back. Like, for instance, you know, when the, when the elk were torn apart, I went up there and, and looked his site over and I took pictures of tracks, and I yeah. I sent him. I wrote out the story as it was told to me, and I sent pictures, and he wrote back. He says, "Yeah, those are pretty good tracks." And, and that was it. There was nothing, no follow-up. Right. Uh, and the same thing with uh, when we went to the Clark Ranch. And Milo, you were there, weren't you, when we took Green out there? Or were yeah. You, you know, yeah. we got we got, we got got out of the van. We heard the screams almost immediately. And then a few minutes later, he says, well, I got to get back to British Columbia. <laughs> and he never he didn't, he didn't record anything. He never went back. And years later, I went to I went to visit him at his house. And we're all sitting around talking, you know, and, and – we had, we had lunch and everything, and, and he says, you know, I, I'm still kicking myself for not taking a recorder that day. Well, what's the whole purpose of coming there for? I mean, I wrote him a letter. I told him what we'd experienced. We heard all this screaming going on, and that's what the Clarks had said, what got us out there in the first place. They'd heard all the screaming going on. So he drove down from British Columbia, from Vancouver, or actually from Harrison Hot Springs, and to hear the screams... We get out there right at dusk. He hears the scream. He doesn't record anything. He gets in the van, goes back to Canada. <laughs> you know, so I, I don't know. I, I was kind of disappointed and all that. I mean, there was no, not even, not even footnotes or anything with that. No, was there? nothing. So, so when he investigates, it's more, it's more out of what kind of Hollywood or newsy type thing or well he was you know he was being a journalist he'd go collect the story up interview the person I know when they went to Northern California and looked for tracks it was always after loggers or road crew builders or somebody had found tracks you know they go take pictures and take the measurements and they go back to Canada there wasn't there wasn't any thorough you know long-term in-depth research it was all you know they'd go collect what there was and back to Canada go and then just file it away. And file it away. Yeah. When Roger wow. Patterson wrote his book, he actually wrote it in 1966, two years before Green wrote his first book on the track of the Sasquatch. And all it was was Green let Patterson go into his file cabinet and pick out what stories he wanted to put in the book. You know, that's that's all his book was. And it was a lot of the same information that Green published two years later. Yeah. That's you know that's crazy where everybody just has to put their little two cents in or you know put their 15 minutes of fame in yeah that, and that's what happens i mean you know people people say and do crap that just gets some attention and yeah like well, you know it's kind of like watching brandy with her stuff you know she's she's really gung ho with it ever since, and now that she has that uh, digital recorder and stuff. It it does help 
as far as clarity. Oh, yeah. is, you know, it, I, I hope we get to the point where the database gets, you know, really more to the point of where it can fall through so everybody can look at it. Yeah, I mean, it's because we're not going in guesswork. We're doing it, you know, more of an empirical route. Uh, right. The data, our database will have a lot more to it than all this guesswork stuff that's out there. Uh, you know, the BFRO has their stuff they put online, but all those reports, but they will twist a report based on their outlook on the subject, not the actual information. So, you know, yeah. to me, that's really kind of worthless. Was it kind of like, like Wicked or all that oh, stuff? Wikipedia? Yeah. yeah. You can put whatever you want in there after they do their stuff, so. Yeah, I mean, it's, it well... What's what's the point of going looking up a, an account? You know, if you're trying to say if you're trying to look into an area and get some idea of what's going on, if they've changed the particulars of a story because it doesn't fit their way of thinking. Well, sensationalism. So. Well, that's part of. I mean, they're trying to get attention. I mean, there's some people. That's all they do is try to get attention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So okay, I'm going to start doing that double checking all that stuff for Alaska and but I've been following up I've been doing all that for all the missing hikers kind of thing. That's where I'm at. So right. until me and Brandy can start heading out and stuff. Um I'm looking for uh uh the stuff online because my my name still isn't on the list. Yeah I gotta get my get on David to see about updating those pages so I know yeah. he's been pretty busy, so we'll get him to update those because we have new people and some other stuff going on there that needs to be added to the pages. So what and, um, what's going on in your neck of the woods, Joe? Um, you know, I put that poster a couple of days ago where they found that uh, dead girl. Did Joe that, throw that in this? In the, <laughs> Did I freeze up now? Can you hear me now? I can't remember. Oh, they found a, okay, your, okay, your picture's no, okay. froze. So, what's going on in your um, in your area, Joe? Um, they found a dead girl in the same as the forest a couple of days ago on the, on the 30th oh, of maybe, June. Maybe his isn't working so well. It's not what was working that? at all. There was, was a. Just, what's that? There was a. There was a dead no, girl. I was asking Joe if, what was going on in his area. And they found a dead girl in the same as the forest. On the thirtieth, can you not hear me? Man, it's breaking up. I can't. Oh, is Joe Joe breaking I, up? I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Joe. I, I can get a little. I can hear I get you. a little bit. Yeah, I got a little piece too. That's what I was trying to say. They well, he says they found girl. a dead girl in the Sam Houston. Yeah. Well, Tommy can hear him. But we can't get any pictures frozen, so I don't know if he hmm. maybe needs to refresh. Yeah. Yeah. I'll get out. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyways, Will, um just uh I, I guess to kind of switch switch topics again. Okay, sure. Um what, <laughs> what is what is your opinion uh, on how um you know the the topic is uh what has changed over the past 50 years? Um, I mean, how has your research changed, you know, from when you were working with Brene and compared to how it is now? You know, I, I've learned a lot watching a lot of these early people. And, and to be honest, they, they would go out and they kind of look around. I mean, they, they would search areas, but it was always after, you know, somebody reported something. There wasn't a lot of, wasn't a lot of right. cold searching areas. And my thinking was that if you went into an area, these things were there, you could look at a pattern of, of reports that were going on in an area. Like when I moved to Vancouver, you know, in the mid eighties, uh, I was looking out at, um, at the different where sightings had been happening in that area. And there was, there were clusters in that area. So I started looking at those areas. Now it had been quite a few years since, you know, are reported made from those areas. Uh, so there wasn't a lot of fresh stuff that I had was aware of, at least initially. 
but it wasn't long before he started finding tracks up there. So you have to really go in there and, uh, and start digging. But you can, to me, you know, a cold search, uh, was just as good, if not better than, you know, if somebody reported something and, and all these people race out there and, and the motivation for racing out there most of the time was just to get tracks, you know, photograph footprints and things like that. So, uh, when you're going to do really do research, you have to get out and kind of figure out what these things are doing. So, Oh, Joe says, um, he has a friend that's a former deputy that's going to look into that. Uh, yeah, that's kind of, I mean, you know, the, kind of going back to the missing people thing is pretty interesting. Um, yeah. You, you know, it's like I, I interviewed uh, Gerald yesterday about his uh, encounters, you know, in Southern Washington. And one of the things we talked about was the guy who came up missing, and I can't think of his name, but uh, while we can't say that it was Sasquatch related, it was really interesting because there was that cluster of activity that was happening right there at the same time. And these things were very aggressive, and this guy came up missing, and it wasn't the first time somebody vanished in that area. The a year before, that lady was on the Vision Quest vanished. So, uh, you know, these things were known to do that, and uh, and it was also. Oh, he says last October there was an area that was roped off that yellow police tape. Yeah, you know, it's pretty interesting. Some of this stuff, I mean. Uh, you know, there's a lot we don't know, and, and of course, uh, except for my inside sources, we do know these things do take people occasionally. So, uh, there's some very interesting stuff with that. So, uh, if we can actually find out information from these accounts, that'll be something. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Well, that's uh, what's going to be so great about your, you know, when you get on uh, your your prime site, you know, where these these witnesses can really tell their story firsthand. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah. When that and happens, all these, this kind of stuff, uh, take more fruit or something like that. It, it's, you know, what's great about that too is, is, is people put their stories out like that. Uh, more people who've had encounters feel comfortable in talking about their stuff. And, and for anybody who listens to this, uh, and again, if they want to get in touch with me, you know, to do an interview, uh, what I can do is, uh, in terms of recording, I can, uh, disguise your voice. You can be completely anonymous. We don't have to get names of places or anything. Uh, and that's one of the things I want to do also is to, to assure people if they want their voices, uh, concealed, we can, we can do that since our, our friend, Mr. Black is going to come on. Uh, you know, I'll be disguising his voice. So yeah, I look forward uh, to that one. It's it's an added protection for people because a lot of people, you know, because their jobs and we have a, quite a few police officers, you know, current and yeah. former. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Tommy says no squatch will be singing "Kumbaya" at your campfire anytime soon. <laughs> that's that's very true. I mean, and that's one of the things you know a lot of people don't know about this subject. You know, they see what garbage is out there and they think that's what the subject is. And, and it's really the farthest from the truth, you know. If people, and I'm hopefully when I when I get Sasquatch signed to predatory behavior published, uh, I can convey the real, you know, topic of this subject, how it really is out there. It's not this nonsense that's out there, and I, I get so sick of nonsense in this subject uh, because it, it really it makes people it puts people off. They don't want to have anything to do with the subject and. Because, you know, it looks like junk, and it is junk. Uh, you know, the real stuff, it, there's a lot more to it than, than what people think. So, Well, um, it makes it makes listen to, well, it makes listen to us even harder because, you know, it is all blindsided by garbage. So, you know, yeah. hopefully they'll, <laughs> they'll take their time and try to listen to it. But it gives them trust, too, because yeah. they're – Stories are being told with a reverence, so that's really a good thing. Floyd brings up, actually brings up a good point. A lot of people think this way. What does it say about your intelligence if you believe in Sasquatch? Well, you know, I don't really give a hoot for anybody who believes in something like that. Uh, I've seen things twice. I know they're out there, uh, and up close the first time. So, 
that it isn't a matter of believing something. It's it's knowing that something's out there. And if you know the history of it, I mean, if people if people think people are stupid because uh, they discuss a topic, it's usually from a position of a lot of ignorance, which means ignorance is necessarily a bad thing. It just means you don't know something. You're not familiar with it. So uh, <clears throat> for those people, I'd say, you know, dig into it a little bit and see what there is. On the other side of that, uh, you know, for us who know th know this stuff or have been involved with it for a long time, there's just way too much uh, information available. And the hard part's weeding through all the garbage. And that's kind of that's kind of uh, you know goes back to the topic that we're discussing here. Is there's so much garbage out there? Uh, it's really difficult for the average person who doesn't know anything about the subject, you know, to go about there and. Um, Oh, he wants, I don't know if we have time for that. Uh, I don't know if you guys really want to hear that again or not, but. Uh, sure, sure. Okay, Floyd asked, tell us about your experience. Um, <laughs> read the books. <laughs> Tom, Tommy says, read the books. Yeah. Uh, well, read my screenplay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. There we go. Well, you know, I'll, I'll do the short version, you know. When, when we were kids back in 1972, we were, we were 14 and, and my friend Mark came over to stay the weekend. You know, we all lived out in, in farm country. It was very rural. Milo knows, you know, Warsaw, yeah. Marshall. And you know where I lived, how it was out there. That was, oh man, hell, all of us lived so far away from each other. You know, you, you had to, we, our parents weren't going to just drive us around. You had to get inventive with going to visit your friends, right? Well, we had to take the bus. If I, yeah, if we, I went to we, Bill's house, I took his bus. Yeah, what you do is you would take you take the other person's you take the person's bus home to their spend the weekend and then you'd come back to school and then go home on your own bus on Monday. <laughs> that's that's how we did it, you know, because our parents weren't going to drag us all over the place. They said, "Oh hell no, you figure it out." So Mark did. came over. Mark came over, and this was the middle of December of 1972. He came over to spend the weekend, and it snowed that year. It was really cold, so it was kind of boring. We said, "Well, hell, what are we going to do?" I said, well, let's go to John's house. John lived about a mile from my house, but it was a lot shorter for you. We were able to go through the woods with a trail. That was that. We could, yeah, we couldn't find the trail because yeah. there was snow on the ground, so we had to walk down the road and then uh, up by that dairy and then down the railroad tracks. So we got about halfway down there, and we ended up finding Sasquatch tracks in the snow, three sets of them. We had never heard the word Bigfoot before, you know, so we saw these big tracks, and there was a pile of guts and nails that weren't frozen. It freaked us out. So, you know, we, whatever was, whatever did this had to be really close by because it was fresh. And so we took off running and, and, and John's dad brought his gun and, and camera and his, all of John's brothers and sisters came along. So we were all up there, you know, ooing and eyeing, wondering what all this was. And then John's dad told us what he knew about it. So, uh, you know, we took off out every weekend looking after that kind of thing. So, you know, kids kids get bored quick. You anything you forget about, it, you go on to something else. Uh, almost two years later, uh, my dog was barking. You know, my colleague was going crazy one night right at dusk. And it was a, you know, raccoon or something out in the yard. So I grabbed a twenty two. My dad always said, you know, shoot whatever comes in the yard. So, uh, and, and he used to shoot above Jehovah's Witnesses, so he didn't shoot at him, but he shot above him to tell him not to come in the house again. <laughs> but, and you know how my dad was. He was he did stuff like that. So he told me crazy. So, you well, he Actually, didn't put up with any he didn't put up with yeah. any nonsense, that's for sure. But anyway, uh so it's his first time. The first time we just saw footprints. So two years later and and this was it would have been about October, I think, of seventy four. Uh, dog was going crazy, and I figured, okay, like I said, it's a raccoon or something. I'm going to go out and shoot it. Uh, no, I, I don't really. No, he says I can't count that. I don't count the first time because we saw tracks. You know, we didn't know what they were. John's dad told us, so we're like, okay, so there's monsters out here. You know, we're kids. <laughs> we didn't know anything. Uh, so the first encounter I had was actually in the fall of '74, actually seeing these two, <laughs> and. I let my dog go because we had to keep him tied up at night. I let him go from his chain. He took off to the tree line. I followed him out there. And he got to the tree line and he froze. 
And then as I approached him, I got about 50 feet or so from him. He spun around and he came tearing back past me. <laughs> I'm watching him run like this back to the house. I'm like, what the hell? Yeah, Willie. And I'm thinking, what the hell is a dog doing, you know? So he runs up to the back porch and he's sitting there kind of shivering. And I'm thinking, what the hell? So I walk up to the tree line and I could hear something in the tree line. I thought, okay, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe it was that porcupine he had to run in with again. So I chambered around. I had just, just grabbed a 22, a single shot 22 and a couple bullets. I shove around in the chamber, you know, shove the bolt forward. And there were some low hanging, you know, those low hanging uh, fir branches that were there in front of that big maple tree. <clears throat> so I kind of pushed my way through and had the rifle like this. And as I walk into this area under the big maple tree, about 15 feet in front of me is here is this massive thing standing there. And it was moving uh, the maple leaves around with its right foot. And, and I mean, it was just this sudden shock of, oh, my God, you know, what in the hell is this? You know, it's an oh, shit moment. Was uh, he doing that to you or were you doing that to him? Well, I, I did it. <laughs> I'm like, holy crap. <laughs> and then and then. I remember in that, and it was just moments, you know, that this happened. I saw, I saw, and I kind of focused on the foot moving, and I, and I can still picture, you know, the tendons running up from the big toe and, and how the hair went down over the foot and stuff. So it stopped moving. We kind of stared at each other, and I thought, shit, what do I do now? It was way too big. This thing was huge. I was probably, you know, well, 16th time, so probably, I don't know what would you say at the time, I was probably, what, about 5'9", five, 5'10". And this thing was, you know, a good two feet above the top of my head. So, um, you know, I thought to myself, God, what am I going to do? So I, and it was huge. It was probably four or five feet across the shoulders and, and really thick. So I, I thought, well, I'll shoot in here. Maybe I'll scare it. And um, when I shot, I heard a noise from my right rear. And I, I turned my head slightly trying to keep an eye on this thing because it was close. And I see another one come from behind the brush and it walked over by the front first one. And it was, it was about a head shorter and I, I'd say a couple hundred pounds lighter. It was, it was smaller than the first one. And that was my cue to get the hell out of there. I thought, crap, there's two of them. I'm out of here. And I took off running. So, uh, yeah, it's 22. That was smart. Well, I, I was thinking, you know, raccoon or skunk or something like that. I mean, yeah. but you know, even if I'd had my 12 gauge or my hunting rifle, it was still too big. I wouldn't have shot at something like that except out of self-preservation. So, uh, yeah. you know, I mean. You aim backwards and or not even aim, just shoot backwards as you're running forward. I'll, I'll tell you what, I was, I was, I just knew any second that this thing was just going to come breathing down my neck, one of them or both of them. You know, I was just hoping to God running that, you know, I wasn't going to get grabbed from the back, but, uh, yeah, Tommy says would have just pissed him off. Absolutely. I mean, you're talking about something that from the front, front of his chest to the back was probably three feet thick. The thing was, this thing was huge. I mean, you can't unless you see something like that. You can't imagine yeah. the dimensions, well, how big something like that. When is. we went out when, when, with you know he who should not be named, and, <laughs> yeah. and that would and be Paul. Thing, <laughs> all you see was these eyes over a tent that's you know twelve feet high. That, that's what happened to Milo. He turned. You turned around to talk to me, and, uh, and I think I and can... you jumped. You jumped. You turned on to talk to hey, me. I was on the other side of the fire, Brian. And, Brian, and we're all you cannot say that. We were all we're four watching. That. that is wrong. We, we, we were all four watching different directions, right, with our backs to the fire, because we'd had these things around us, and they were screaming and doing all this shit. And Milo said something, and I turned like this to talk, and he was turned around. And when you turned back, he goes. Oh shit! And I swear you jumped like two feet <laughs> off the ground. <laughs> and, and and then you said you saw this thing. It was it was leering at him over the over the top of the tent. Well, all you I know. saw was like, it, you know, it's kind of like the shining of eyes o over the campfire. Right, right. All I saw was just a. I didn't even see head. It was know? it was crazy. It was crazy that night. I mean, it so, scared the hell out of all of us. You know, I. I well, you know, we were God, we were, we were in tenth grade, eleventh grade, weren't we? Uh, At that time, geez, that must have been seventy six, I think, wasn't it? Probably the spring of seventy six. Well, it must have been. It had to have been way before our our yeah, it was Saint Helen yeah. trip. 
Oh, yeah, right. It was the spring of 76 because we went to St. Helens in November 76. Yeah, because that's when all of us joined the Army then, so we all right. had to take that off and do our little thing there. So, yeah, I, I would say it had to be over 15 feet, right? Well, the tent was six feet high, and you said it was a couple feet above that. So and remember, we found those 18-inch tracks when, when Dingbat was pulled out partly out of the tent. So. Oh, Dingbat now. Well, you know, whatever, whatever title Are we works. upgrading his name? Well, from he who shall not be named. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're kind of out of time, fellas. So let's, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, I don't know about some of the comments that remain the side, you know. Hey, can you uh, block some of that crap? Well, I, I'm going to ask David. I'm going to find out So because uh, we don't need a lot that of that. That way you can take junk, that so. kind of crap off. Yeah. So, fellas, uh, and everyone, join us again next week. I, I said I'm going to put these on you on my YouTube page. So, uh, you know, if anybody couldn't listen to it here, uh, you can tell people they can go to my YouTube page and, and find them there. So, uh, check out the website williamjebning.com. Check out our Facebook page. It's the JRG Bigfoot Research page. Uh, we got over 700 people so far there, which is pretty good. I think it's a, what's the page only like a month old or a little over a month. Yeah. So we're doing pretty good with that. So anyway, fellas, thanks for coming on, and uh, we'll be here again next week. Okay, take care. So we, we try to get a, a, you know, a chronological uh, order of events as they happen. So Did you record? Looks like, what's that? Oh, did you record uh, Brandy's on Skype? Yeah, actually, actually our, our friend Tom Carroll and I uh recorded that because Tom had some questions he wanted to ask and and hopefully Tom will, will be able to get back involved with us at some point because Tom uh, is really great. He has a really great perspective and and will sometimes dig a little bit deeper into some of the certain aspects, you know, of an encounter, you know, where I'm looking at more of the, the overview yeah. and, and we'll will target real specific things that that based on my experience, what what I'm looking for informationally and sometimes tom will able to dig up some of those kind of grassroots portions and 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 open up even more things so uh, yeah that interview actually was uh, was a really interesting one so uh cool. and like i said our, our friend mr black has has consented to do an interview of course i have to disguise his voice and everything but uh uh that's something that tom was going to help me with also and and also david so uh that'll be a really you know that'll be a one of a kind uh, situation. Here. Oops! Looks like Scott's having Scott's having difficulty. And there's Joe. Hello, Joe. How you doing, buddy? Uh, so that's kind of that's kind of the the news scene. You know, there's just some different things going on. Uh, like I said, I've been posting everything these labs, and I'm going to be doing it every week from now on. I'm going to post them on my YouTube channel. So if anybody's having trouble coming here looking at these. Uh, you know, they can go there and just click on them and listen. And you will see this and the videos there too. So you'll see us uh, clowning around and, and talking and stuff. So, <laughs> so I guess the only other thing I'd have news wise is of course, we're always looking for new members for the Jevening research group. Uh, we have new members all across the country, all across Canada, uh, hoping to get some people in Alaska interested, but uh, everywhere we're looking for people everywhere. Uh, we have a team in Australia that's growing, one in England and one in Norway. So uh, we're not we're not just localized here to the U.S. You know, we want to expand the network, and and what we are is we're a we're a network of field researchers, uh, and we all work closely with each other, share information. You know, uh, moving towards the goal of uh, resolving the issue of, of the Sasquatch existence. Did you hear so, what's go what happened in Alaska? Where What's four, that? four campers or hunters got two got murdered and the other two are missing. When did this happen? Um, I just read about it. It's probably about th during the Fourth of July weekend. Any any idea? Did they say? I'm I'm looking into it. Really, I I got like uh, um friends up there that uh that are checking it out too. So. So no, really, no idea what the cause no, was they, or anything. They talked about. They said Bigfoot. So really, yeah. And that that was that was the official saying that or. No, it's it's. Uh, 
probably more hearsay than or secondhand. Okay, so it wasn't like the uh, maybe the reporters or somebody. Hey, there, Scott. How you doing this evening? Yeah, right now I just it's kind of like in between. different. Oh, Scott, Scott's audio is there. He is. <laughs> is 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 your audio working, buddy? The camera on oh, there it is. Okay, I guess he's he's still trying to figure out the camera. So that's the phone. So uh, Bruce Kelly, he's the one that suggested topics for discussion this evening. And oops, I, I can still hear him. <laughs> so the topic this evening, folks, is Sasquatch evidence and why it's changed over the past fifty years. Is that me echoing? I don't. I'm, no. I don't know. Maybe, I think maybe that was Scott's phone. I hear you, but it sounds like it's coming over somebody else's laptop. I, I hear you okay. Okay. Oh, maybe it's Scott. Okay, just saying, Scott, turn your volume off or get earbuds. <laughs> that might be what it is. Maybe it's coming through his phone and, and coming back through. So anyway, uh, Bruce had a great idea, and one of the things that really drives me crazy about this subject is having known this topic for a long time, you know, 43 years of involvement now, uh, when you go back and look at the first two or three decades and the reports, and a lot of those in John Green's books and a few other people's books from those times, one of the things you notice is a lot of... Uh, commonalities between the witness accounts. There's a lot of similar particulars from one story to the next. In other words, there wasn't all this tree structure stuff. There wasn't, you know, ob the obvious stuff like, you know, the interdimensional garbage and mind speaking Sasquatch and that kind of baloney. Uh, that's, that's sort of the above and beyond stuff, if you ask me. But just the basic stuff, there wasn't a lot of stuff back then okay I heard a little bit of echo there I'm not sure where that come from uh, there was a lot of stuff back then that you didn't hear that you hear now and and I'll give you for instance on that uh, I would almost bet you see now I am hearing an echo I don't know what's wrong with that yeah, I think that's coming from Scott or somebody you think because so? it happened just as he got on okay um, if you were to go back and look at reports, especially with these tree structures and things like that, I would bet that you would not see any of that stuff prior to 2010. And there's a reason I say that. Uh, when I first found snap trees back in 1991, uh, that really, that kind of stuff wasn't talked about anymore. And it was really very little known. In fact, when I went to Bob Titmus's house one time back in 88, uh, and he showed me, you know, the little twisted tree limbs that he found. And he had found lots of them. And he said that he always found them, uh, you know, in conjunction with Sasquatch footprints. So he was pretty sure that's what was doing it. So he didn't know what to think of it. I personally didn't know what to think of it because I hadn't really seen anything like that and to me. What he had was too easy, would have been too easily. And thought that it was like a oh. big foot. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, uh, th there's, there's some people, and again, like I said, there are people who would jump on any little aspect of this subject and, and utilize it to, to make themselves look like there's somebody. So one of the people that I, I came into contact with, and this was back in the late 80s, uh, was a gentleman by the name of Datus Perry. Oh, yeah. Datus and I, I won't go into. We can talk about Datus at length at another time. But and then of course, in, in the updated version of uh, In Search of the Unknown, Datus Perry occupies about fourteen pages in there. So, which actually will translate into more in the actual uh, volume. But uh, you know, I, I was associated with Datus for a number of years, and and he was basically worthless when it comes to information. But because he lived on the other side of Scamania County, I couldn't be wrong 
you know, I mean, I, I had so much area to cover, so I, I needed people in outlying areas as context. If they heard something, then they'd call me and I could go out and, and you know, make a special trip. But uh, I was working, you know, Clark and Skamania counties systematically, so I, I really needed those contacts out there. So Davis was one of those contacts. And every time, you know, we get a call, we race out there, and, and nothing ever panned out. So on one of these times, and this was funny, this is one of the last times I went anywhere with Davis Perry was that uh, my good friend Carlos Bazito and I, Carlo got a call from Davis and uh, Davis as well. You know, there was a witness that saw a Sasquatch and it was near where I had my second sighting on the Washu River. But Davis insisted that we go all the way to Carson to his house. Now that was more than twice the distance away. And then he insisted on driving his old Rambler station wagon with us in it back to the location. And he didn't drive the highway. Oh, no, we had to go the long way around through Skamania County. And, of course, it was raining. It was hor horrible weather that day. So I was wet, and I don't particularly enjoy being wet. <laughs> and uh, I, I was not a happy camper by the time we arrived back at, at the place where we could have been there in 15 or 20 minutes had we known where the spot was from, from my house. Um, so we, we, um, we arrived at the spot, and, and the ground there is, is a lot of gravel. It's, it's very hard packed. And... Datus and Carlo were arguing over a mud puddle. You know, Datus was saying, well, it's a Bigfoot track. Carlo said it's a mud puddle. I looked at them both like they were both insane, and I walked off. I was fed up with both of them. So I, uh, I happened to, there was an old, old log, a really old, overgrown one, barely a trail left there. So I was walking down, and I thought, I just wanted to get away from those two and their, and their bickering. So... And to calm down a little bit. So I walked down this road and there was a big pile of gravel there. It was probably four or five feet high. It was, it was a really large one. And um, uh, there were two huge footprints in this gravel. Now, I, I, weighed, I weighed at the time about 200 pounds. I didn't make even a scratch on this gravel. But these tracks were 18 inches long and they were more than six inches deep in this gravel. Beautiful outlines, you know, not great detail, but because of the gravel, it was, you know, fairly, uh, uh, I don't know, probably inch diameter gravel, angular. <laughs> so we we um, we got up there and I told the guys, I said, hey, I, I think I found the tracks, you know, they both ignored me. So and they were still arguing over a damn mud puddle. So I said the hell with both of them. And I, I quit going. <laughs> with with datas i said that i you know enough of datas but um you know the sasquatch had been there the witnesses we never did find a witness of course because Davis had the contact information and i think it was all in his head i don't think he ever wrote anything down so <laughs> you know anyway that was that was that story but actually will i was thinking about um another like an older guy like he was like Almost in his eighties, I think. That was that, Davis. that was Davis. Oh, 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 okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah, no, Davis. I, and I don't know if you guys. This is a little off topic, I guess. But you know it's how these blabs go. You know, we sort of start one place and we go all kinds of directions. But um, <laughs> Davis, when I met Davis, he was in his eighties. I mean, the guy looked about one hundred and eighty, but uh, and he always insisted insisted on driving. And, and the mountains north of, of uh, Carson, Washington, are, are pretty steep. They're pretty big mountains. And he would always drive. He had one speed. It was as fast as his old van could go. And, uh, you know, which was usually about, you know, fast enough to kill us all. And there was only two seats, the front two seats. And usually took his, uh, his, uh, his wife with us. And so the two of them were in the front. And Davis is driving like this, muttering under his breath the whole time. And the van is full of old car parts and just junk, garbage, crap. And poor Carlo and I, man, we're, we're sitting on this junk, being thrown back and forth. And, and I just knew we were going to go careening over a cliff, you know, into a thousand foot you know, gorge yeah. and die in a ball of flame at any time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, 
I, that, okay, I was scared. I was scared to death every time he was with us. And it got to the point where I said, no, I think either Car to Carlo, I said, either you or I are going to drive. We're not letting Davis drive anymore. <laughs> or before we go up these places, you know, we're going to have him stop. I'm going to walk up the hill. We'll let him drive and kill himself. I'm going to walk. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. So when you, when you find all this, you know, you know, when you're looking and you see these snap trees and stuff, yeah. the diameter or even the structures, I mean, some of them look like they're, I can carry them. You yeah, know? absolutely. I, I always look, I mean, my criteria is usually something that's, that's so far uh, out of the ordinary. In other words, right. I, I, I'll see weathered ones, especially old ones that are a year or two old. And I'll think, yeah, that's probably what that is. But I usually don't pay a lot of attention to that stuff. I, I look for the fresh stuff. In fact, when I put notes from the field, both those, uh, the first one was in 1991. The second one I found in 2003. Right. And and they were both, both of them I found in the month of July. Uh, there was no bad weather. They were freshly done, uh, you know, very similar to one another. And they were so, the second one, would uh, could have been made by weather conditions, you know, with, with small, and they weren't they weren't very big. They were they were relatively small. So, uh, I didn't think much about it. I kept it in the back of my mind until 1991. And I told us before when when my friend Jack and I were hiking up in the Washougal River watershed, and we were way back in there. I mean, <laughs> really deep into that country, long way from any accessibility. Uh, we were 2,200 feet up in elevation on this slope, and I found the first tree. And when I know, I found 13 of them in a line. And the only reason I stopped following that line is because we were running out of daylight. So, uh, I, and I found another one a few years later in Northern California. And then I started seeing them here and there, but not you didn't find them often. I mean, it was it was not something that was common. But once you'd see something like that you'd see it really fast. And I always theorize that if these creatures, you know, had been around here for hundreds, even thousands of years, and if they did things that other primates do, which is comparative anthropology, and it's very something very reasonable to expect, you know, we look at what other primates do. Maybe not out of the question if they do something, maybe to mark territory in one fashion or another. Uh, I thought to myself, well, okay, this is reasonable. So I thought if they do something, it had to already existed. In other words, people would see this when they first came to the Pacific Northwest, we'll say, and it was just part of the background. It wasn't anything special. So when you looked at the snap trees, you wouldn't realize what it was unless you knew what it was. And then it would just stand out instantly. You know what I'm saying? Right. So after I published Notes from the Field in 2010, and I, I really had to think hard about putting those pictures in that book, and I did it just because, well, partly I knew I knew all this stuff was going to come out. Everybody was going to start seeing this stuff everywhere, whether it was weather breaks or, or what have you. It was going to be out there every place. So um, I put it out because... I was the first one that really discovered it, and, and I wanted my name attached to it. So, and as soon as I put that out in the book, it went. People went crazy with it. every every everything that looked, you know, trees that fall together looked like something that could be Sasquatch. People were jumping on it, making that claim. You know, so that's an example of of uh, because prior to that, I mean, the, the stories were fairly consistent in details. You know, you never really got any of this extra stuff. It was always the person had a sighting. They talk about what the creature did, if it made sounds. Um, and that was pretty much it. Sometimes they saw him eating, sometimes, you know, doing whatever kind of behavior, then the creature would take off. That was kind of in a nutshell what a lot of the stories were. And, and, and Will, um, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. It, no, no, go right ahead. Right ahead. <laughs> but, uh, didn't you even say the two that like um, like when you and Renee were, were um, kind of discussing this, you actually intentionally withhold or withheld information from the witnesses 
to gauge their authenticity of their accounts. Yeah, they they used to tell me uh, that that's one of the things they did. That was standard procedure was to, you know, to not really give away a lot of information. And, and, and I still interview people that way. Uh, you know, I go, and like you were saying, you know, it, it's a stop of interviewing you, you let people tell their story and then you listen to what they're saying and listen for the particulars. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, you can kind of tell, especially because there's some, today there's so much information out there before we would hold things back. And if they would say something that was a piece of information that was held back, something that wasn't exposed publicly. Right. right. Then, right. then it was, then it was a pretty sure guess that what they were saying was accurate. There, there was, there was a, a, a credibility right dimension added to their story so but today you know everybody just blasts everything out in public because uh you know they want attention so they put everything out there you know they scrape the bottom of the barrel for little tidbits and they blast it out there because they want to be experts in, in the world of bigfoot <laughs> sorry i had to laugh about that one <laughs> there's no such thing as expert it's true. it's true it's true it is so today you have to listen to people's stories more carefully because uh, because people inadvertently hear things or see things, whether it's on television or YouTube or wherever, radio shows, podcasts, and those artifacts can get stuck in their head, whether they want them to or not. Uh, and when if they see something, you know, in, in their way of explaining it, they might inadvertently use some of those artifacts that they picked up along the way. It's part of their frame of reference. Right, right. So you have to listen for that and then you have to ask, well, is is that real or is that something that they injected into the story as a way of explaining something that they wouldn't know how to explain otherwise? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, aside from the people that just make things up out there, and there there's a few of those, but... Uh, <laughs> But we won't go down that road today. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know what are you guys, what are you guys' thoughts on that? I mean, there's, there's, uh, man. I mean, you know, like I said, the, the, it, and it's not that they, I, I can't say that they won't utilize, you know, making some kind of a structure with trees. But some of these really ornate things, uh, and I looked at some of these, and, and I'll tell you, here's, here's a good example. One of my, one of our people who's a. Um, uh, Native American on the Flathead Reservation, uh, Win. Uh, he he sent me some. He sent me a message once, and he says, "You know, I had a thought about some of these structures." He says, "You know, a lot of hunters will go, serious hunters go off the grid. You know, and they'll they'll take their backpacks and they'll go hunting a long ways, and it's a lot easier to say take just the cover of a structure than it is to take." The structure itself. In other words, they'll take tree limbs and they'll set them up in such a way where all they got to do is they go to their their camp and they use it every year, and and they drape the the covering over it and they've got their shelter, right? So he said a lot of these things that people are claiming are Bigfoot structures may be nothing more than something a, a serious hunter has set up, or you know, a serious outdoors person. You know what I mean? Yeah, and and, and will um, yeah, I, you, you tell the story in the in, in the in the book? Um, I, I I'm sorry, I forget the name uh, of the guy, but didn't like um, he see like a like a puddle of water? It was, and it's because of the type of tree it was. It was a it was a ponderosa pine, and those don't snap quite as easily. They're a little bit more. I I, I hate to say rubbery, but kind of kind of like that. They don't snap that easy. So. It was twisted like this, like you would, like you'd wring water out of a cloth. Okay, well, that, that's yeah. I like and that, that was that was crazy. Now I'm telling you, it was in the middle of a stand of trees. There were probably twenty or thirty of them, the same age, same height, and everything. And um, it was right in the middle. So if it was weather or anything else, the trees standing right next to it would have been done. So this one was picked out right in the center and done this and there were no bear claw marks or anything like that on it uh i always look for all these things to try to weed out any possibility you know bigfoot's the very last thing that i'll think about and only if if i can't think of another reason why uh you know it could be something else <clears throat> so i mean anyway and and, and we'll um 
I guess to change the, the, the subject a little bit, um, again, um, <laughs> um, about the, the topic, um, why hasn't it changed in the past 50 years? Like, like, what is your take on that? I mean, like, because I know that, like, you know, obviously when, when Teddy Roosevelt was, was writing about the Bowman story, you know, that, that was yeah. like decades ago. But how has it changed in recent years? Well, that's a good point. Um, you know, I, of course, now, you know, we, we get all these, uh, and one of the big things is, uh, what do you call it? The um, uh, uh, hi there. Okay, we got somebody calling it. Uh, what do you call them? Uh, people call them blob squatch, which I think are totally useless. Uh, you know, you get a ton of people putting this junk out there, and it's just that it's junk. I think you know, there's nothing useful in any of that. It's it's all guesswork. It's um, uh. uh it's, it's speculation. It's, spec it's all speculation. Yeah, exactly. And see, there's, there's two there's two big problems, or not problems. There's two main uh, there's two main directions uh, Brian. that this topic, Brian. and one of them is the predominant one that's been going on all this time, and it's all these people Hello. either doing doing guests or and nonsense. Hello? Hello, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hi. So, so I just wanted to know, uh, Brian, how do you get that uh, skin color, uh, the red shade that you have there? The what? The what red shade, the, the red skin color that he has. I, I have a tan, but I haven't been able to get the redness that he has that I'm trying to achieve. <laughs> well, I guess it's it's just uh, living in Florida. Oh, okay. So you have sunburn. I see. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Sunburn, tan, whatever you want to call okay, it. Okay, we're not, we're not, you can keep calling in, but we're not going to, we're not going to deal with nonsense here tonight. Uh, oh, let's bring, let's bring Joe on. Joe wants to come on, so we'll bring Joe on. You know, that's. Hey, Joe. How are you doing, guys? Good. How are the you? One nice doing? thing about what we do with a you know, sensible discussion, we'll talk. Hi. Tell us what he likes. I don't care. It doesn't matter. This is this is our chat. So, you know, bugger off. <laughs> That's, hey, Joe, how you doing, buddy? I, I really uh, don't good, care. Man. You know, you know what I'm saying. It's it's we're here to do this, and and it's this is for us and for our people. If you don't want to be part of it, you're going to be a knucklehead. Take a hike. You know. Yeah, there's a couple of trolls in here. <laughs> I, I was a drill sergeant in the Army, so I'm being very nice in this part of my life, but I can revert back to that really quickly. So, Oh, yeah, man, uh, me too. I'm tell you what. I used to be they, really, really a, a thuggish kind of a guy, and these people just don't know, <laughs> man. So anyway, um, I don't know where we were at with this. Um, Joe, we're talking about uh, – some of the stuff, and I know we were talking about was this uh, stuff like these blob squatch pictures. You know, these people put stuff on, uh, you know, Facebook and all over the place, and, and they, it's all it's all geared to get a lot of attention. And I, I've had people look at my own pictures. I had a couple pictures that uh, one picture had something kind of interesting in it. I didn't know what it was, but what I what I wanted somebody to do was to try to enhance it to see what was in the picture. So I had somebody, a couple of people did it, and what they did was there was an object at the top of the picture, and they would go down to this part of the picture and come up with all kinds of these different, uh, you know, images that were supposed to be Bigfoot, and there was nothing there. I, mean, I was standing 50 feet from the tree line when I took the picture, so I know what was there and what wasn't there. But when I took this other picture, there was something up in the upper part of the tree, so... Um, uh, anyway, that's that's where you know a lot of these come from. And if you notice, when you look at some of those blob squatch pictures, one of the things that's interesting is uh, they're the same color. The image, whatever it is, is supposed to be the object in the picture is the same color as the background. You know, so you know, these guys. I don't know about some of these people. Yeah, I can even kick them out. That's what, we, that's what you need a feature. To so anyway, you know, that's one of the things that we see today, and along with the uh, the tree structures and stuff like that. So, 
How about the rocks that were stacked way back out there? I mean, didn't I mean weren't those those were unusually see that's the kind of stuff if I can do it, yeah, it it's not Sasquatch. It's kind of like art. If if I can do art, then I wouldn't be here. You know what I mean? Well, the rock stack thing is is something that you don't find very often, and those are only in right. certain places. So. Uh, Anyway, uh, yeah. Yeah, you know they're like insects. You just pull their wings off, and then they, <laughs> they you watch them screw around. Yeah, you know? exactly. I, I can't wait to find these kind of people. Hey, hey, well, um, this is kind of curious like, that you brought up this it up about the rock formations. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, what do you think about those things? I mean, are they like kind of territorial things or? Um, like, like, what's your take on that? Well, you know, from the inside sources I have, they talked about... Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of the Bigfoot Notes from the Field. Uh, News-wise, I'm trying to think. We haven't got a whole lot of news. We have a new member joined in Connecticut uh, today. So Don Gummo, who's our um, assistant regional director for the Northeast, I... I sent him his contact information so Stephen, if you're listening welcome uh and for you guys who don't know you know we had some people uh trouble getting on blab and listening or participating so uh one of the questions was people were asking me if we could put the the shows on youtube so that's what i've been doing i've been uploading the, the recorded ones already onto youtube and then i'll be putting them on every week you know after we after we're done i'll uh put those on youtube so you know, if you can't listen to him here, you know, tell tell people you might know who can't uh, to go to my YouTube channel and they're loaded up there. So uh, I've only got about I think eleven or twelve of them up there so far. But uh, you know, it's it, it's huh? Is it eleven or twelve? And one of the two. I don't know. I I load them up. I know I keep been key. I've been writing them down to make sure I I know which ones I put on there and they're not put up there twice. So uh, so that's what's going on. Uh, I'm not really doing any writing. I'm kind of suspended writing at the moment uh, in favor of trying to get the uh, the podcast, the premium co- podcast up and going. Uh, one of the problems I've had with it would be actually available by now, but I, I paid a guy, a professional, to make me a, a professional introduction, you know, a lead in, you know, with the music and all that stuff. And uh, he had some personal problems, and then, you know, one thing led to another, and I, I paid the guy in March to make this thing, like, a three-minute intro, and it still hasn't happened. So now I'm going to have to find, you know, somebody else that can do this for me. I'm still recording interviews. In fact, if anybody, uh, you know, listening, if you've had a Bigfoot encounter or two and, and you, you'd be interested in uh, doing an interview with me, uh, we can do it either with uh, – I've been recording with um, – Skype, but I also have a, a way to record over the telephone also. And then uh, those are, I'm kind of stockpiling those so that when the podcast starts, you know, I'll be posting those to iTunes and my website, williamjebning.com, once a week. So you'll be able to go up there and, and listen to those. Uh, and just so everybody knows, it is it is a paid show. It's $5 a month, which is really low when it comes to things like this because everybody else is charging you know, anywhere from seven to nine dollars to twelve dollars a month, and uh, you know, I, I think I think for what you're getting, you're getting, and it's primarily uh, eyewitness accounts. It's the witnesses telling their stories, so it's it's a pretty good show. Uh, the show is going to be called "Witness of the Unknown," and I'm hoping as soon as I get the intro done, uh, we're going to put that up and it'll be available. First, we're going to continue doing the blabs here every week, uh, and that's. You know the way it is. It's not going to cost anything. It's this is always free. What we do here, nobody paid for this anyway. So, <laughs> thank God for that. So let me let me give a real quick plug here to our friends at the Sasquatch Coffee Company, uh, Gunner though, and and folks are all really good people. So, and then our own stuff. Now I want to give a special mention to uh, Shane Church. He's the the artist that made this artwork. And Shane is working on a couple new pieces. Uh, I don't want to give away the one that's almost done. It's pretty good. It's actually kind of a reboot of a really old cartoon. Uh, 
but it's really it's really great when it comes to this subject. And he he listens every week. I didn't know he was actually listening to the uh, the blab, but he sent me an email the other day, and he says, "Oh, by the way, when I'm done with this, when I'll start working on the uh, uh, the Happy Meal cartoon." <laughs> <laughs> so I, I told him, I said, well, be careful on the copyright part. And, and Shane, if you're listening, you know, we, we have to skirt around, you know, using McDonald's references. So, uh, and I guess the other news, of course, Brian, Brian here has been writing uh, a screenplay based on my book, In Search of the Unknown. And Shane, uh, or Brian, I read through it today. It looks really great. Of course, now that, now that you've got to the end, there's, you know, some definitely some suggestions I'll make. And and I guess I'll just go through it section by section, and you and I will work on it. And I'm going to send it to Milo so he can look at it too, since he was involved in it and oh uh, get his input. <laughs> yes, I was. So uh, I don't know if, uh, the topic of the show, topic. Oh, go ahead, Brian. Go ahead. Oh well, I was just going to say about your um, about the show about the um, the, the eyewitness. I, I will say that having listening to you for you know you know tons of 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 these months, I can tell you that that when you um, identify a witness and you um, talk to them and you can get their story out, it's just the best thing that you could possibly get. Definitely, um, I agree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you are a, a masterful interviewer. <laughs> Well, I appreciate that. I'll give you a little, a little bit of, of a plug to, to that. I, I don't think I'm that good. I think I think I just kind of I just kind of bumble through them. But you know, uh, you know, the ones I have recorded so far, and I've, like I said, I've got about three months worth recorded. Uh, you know, and, and in a list of people yet to record, uh, there's some really good encounter stories that I've already got uh, ready to go. So, uh, you know, people are going to enjoy the podcast. And like I said, for for five bucks a month, you know, you're getting you're getting four shows. It works out to a buck and a quarter a show. It's going to be available on iTunes and my website, WilliamJavening.com. So, uh, and, and what what and what's that? Go ahead, Brian. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I was just saying, um, one of the, one of the things that I that it, I think is awesome when you interview people is that you tell them to explain their story first. Like you don't ask questions. You tell yeah. them, hey. Tell me exactly what was happening at that day, at that time, and that kind of um, feeds into the genuine, like you know, the, the genuine report. Yeah, you know, in, in my opinion, it doesn't do a whole lot of good to start asking them a whole bunch of pointed questions because you can misdirect them or maybe derail them from their train of thought. I want to hear, I want to hear what it was that they experienced. Kind of like a story. You know, and, yeah, and then we can go back and ask questions, or you know, sometimes I'll, I'll maybe ask them to, to clarify something as we go along, you know, or if I if I think, especially somebody you know, like there's a couple I know that I've actually interviewed previously, uh, you know, privately, and uh, you know, sometimes they they tend to get ahead of themselves, and I'll have them back up a little. 